So a few of you are in physics cycle, right? Um, okay, look, uh, forget that part. Um, so if I give you just one pair of points, uh, will you be able to draw a straight line? No. Uh, yes, the session is being recorded. Uh, just one pair of points, you will be able to draw a straight line, correct. Um, you will actually get a family of lines. Uh, but that's not the point. Okay, so now let's assume I give you two points. So x1, y1 and x2 and y2. Um, how many lines will you be able to draw? One line, okay. Okay, so this is um, something you would have learned until 12th grade, right? <laughs> Sorry, someone was saying something. Okay. Um, so, okay. Uh, guys, do try to like keep your messages to the chat only because, uh, you know, I don't want multiple voices on this recording. So, un only if you have a doubt that cannot be asked on the chat, um, feel free to, you know, stop me and ask. But if I'm asking for, you know, some answers, try to keep it to the chat. Okay, um, so this is something you would have learned until 12th grade, but we are going to expand on this concept. So um, let us start off. Um, for those of you who do not know, my name is Aditya and I'm the you know head mentor for machine learning here. Um, there are other mentors on this call as well. Uh, their names are Shreyas and Sudanva. Uh, if you guys do have a few doubts, they will be answering it on the chat if I don't answer it immediately. Uh, but don't worry, we will be having some checkpoints where we will answer your doubts. Okay, so um, you guys said that, you know, if I give you two points, you will be able to draw one line. But if I give you, let's say, three points or four points or let's say a thousand points, you can't really draw a line, right? Can you draw a line or no? not? No. No, you won't get a family of lines. Uh, you have multiple points. You won't get a line. So um, assume that, um, you know, I give you something like, let's say, something here, something here, something here, something here, something here. Okay. And I tell you, um, you know, draw a line that, connects all these points. Will you be able to do that or not? No. So in this case, what you will do, or at least the people who are in physics cycle, I think you guys would have done an experiment on this. Um, you draw something known as a best fit line. Yeah, someone commented that, I mean, messaged that. Yes. So it is known as the best fit line. Um, the one, the method which you guys learned is the least squares uh, method. So what the best fit line does is you basically, instead of drawing a line that uh, go through every single point, the objective is to draw a line which sort of, uh, you know, fits the pattern of the data which is present. So something around this, such that, you know, you fit the pattern of the data which is present. And it kind of, you know, as Alvin said, it passes through as many points as it can. So that is called a best fit line. So let's not worry about that. That is kind of like the intuition behind what regression is. Now, um, let us actually, you know, not talk about only one variable. You guys did it for colorimetry. Okay. I mean, I've forgotten it by now, so I don't know. Um, physics cycle is like in my head, so I remember that. Anyway, so what exactly is regression so regression basically is a family of algorithms in machine learning which are used to predict a continuous real value um, so very technical definition but basically if i give you a certain set of features what you're supposed to do is predict a real value for that set of features for example um, let us say you are predicting house prices okay and I tell you, okay, um, my the house that I want has three bedrooms. It has 
uh, three bathrooms. It, the area of the house is okay. Let's assume it's hundred, and some other features are there. Okay, and I tell you, okay, I want a house that has all these kinds of features, and your job will be to predict what will be the price of a house with these kind of features. So that is the point of regression. Uh, basically, I give you a certain number of features and you are supposed to predict another continuous real value from these features. So, yeah, that is regression. Um, we are going to move on to a few notations that will be followed. Actually, before the notations, let me just, um, yeah. Do we try to reduce or maximize number of inputs? Um, in this case, the number of inputs are always constant. So what we are going to be doing is actually called um, normal multiple linear regression. So the equation is not this. Um, the equation is, the equation which we'll be solving is, um, I'm going to use the popular notations here. So. Now, um, the first thing you guys will realize after seeing this is uh, you will not be able to plot this on two dimensions, right? Because there are multiple x variables here and x over here refers to the features. So the thing that which the thing which you guys had learned in uh, physics cycle or chem cycle, whatever, was a case known as simple linear regression, uh, which is basically, you know, And this is also what you guys know as, uh, you know, a simple, you know, linear equation for a line in two dimensions. But this entire thing is the original, you know, regression formula, which is, you know, and it's called the regression formula, where theta, this theta, these are known as the parameters or the weights. and each x here is a feature all right so in a machine learning problem the objective for an algorithm is given an equation you need to find the set of parameters or weights that will be able to fit that particular line um, so far is, are you guys following a simple yes or no in machine learning, what we try to do is we are basically trying to learn this. You need to learn the, you know, the parameters or the weights because those are the things that will actually affect your line, right? For example, if you have y equals mx plus c, what are you exactly trying to find out when I give you, you know, two points? You first find out the slope which is in this case theta 1 um, and from that you find out theta naught right using you know all those formulae that you have um, so basically what you do using two variables using two sets of points you need to do using multiple points yes effect of change in variables to a particular attribute yes exact that is the you know exact thing for weight uh, how so given x, you need to find theta, yes. So now I'm going to, you know, show you how exactly you get an input or in the real world when you're doing machine learning, how you exactly um, obtain the features. So I'm just going to move this on top. So usually um, your set, your input is given as a matrix. So let's say x is your matrix here. Okay, you know, let's do it in black. So x is your input here and this is a normal matrix okay um let's say it has m rows and n columns so um m rows and n columns means this is m and this is n so now what does each you know let's say row signify so let's say we are doing 
let's say we are doing the same um, procedure where we were predicting house prices then i would say um, assume that this uh, the first um, okay let's just take one here example let's say the first element here refers to uh, number of bedrooms followed by the number of let's say bathrooms followed by let's say the area which is 100 okay and okay there's some other feature called 200 um, based on location let's say um, okay let's say it's a five and so on so this could be one row here okay and corresponding to each row here you will have a single vector y which consists of the actual values for that house so let's say this house is uh, 50 it's just imaginary values but you know 40 30 this is 60 and 20 all right and so for each row you will have one corresponding um, sort of value basically for each set of features it will correspond to one particular certain value the objective is given this amount of data you need to find uh, you know the set of parameters that i had mentioned so um so far hopefully you guys are again following um any other notations okay no i think i've covered all the notations here so um someone said they didn't understand okay so in you know popular notations or whatever the set of inputs that you receive is referred to as the x matrix x is always your input because if you guys know from math or whatever in popular notation you, you have y equals f of x right so similarly the matrix x is often called your input matrix or uh, the input to your problem so x is the input matrix which contains the features which you need to store okay so um yeah so let's say you have okay a data set okay let's go with proper numbers let's say you have a data set um, i'll just do the example here let's say you have a data set okay and your data set has five rows so you have data on five houses okay and so you have five houses and for each house let's say you have three features okay so let's say the features are um, okay same thing number of bedrooms the number of bathrooms and the area okay in this case your x matrix will look something like this you will have five rows and three columns okay so for house number one uh, let's say house number one has three bedrooms two bathrooms and area is 100 and the price of the house is 100 okay price i mean the actual price of the house for house number two let's say this is two this is three and the price is 200 sorry uh, the area is 200 and let's say the price comes to be 300 now let's say this is a much bigger house this is five this is five and this is 500 and let's say this is 600 this is how your input will look like so your x will be five rows and three columns and this will be uh, three rows and one column did you understand this using this example okay good um uh, guys please don't you know share your screen by mistake okay um given a set of parameters it learns to predict yes um you are your job is to actually learn the parameters themselves okay um so i hope my screen is still visible because you know someone was trying to share their screen um uh, it's not visible let me just resume okay i have resumed it hopefully you guys should be able to see okay um so moving on So now um, the objective is as I said you have um, h of x equals theta naught plus theta 1 x 1 plus okay where x 1 refers to the first feature x 2 refers to the second feature and so on. So let's take this example 
um, in this case the example is um, 50 equals theta naught plus um, okay theta 1 in 3 plus theta 2 into um, 3 again plus theta 3 into 100 plus theta 4 into 200 plus theta 5 into um, it's 5. So in this case this is the equation that is formed okay. Now the objective is you find this 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 and so on this this and this such that it fits your line perfectly and you get the value which is here 50 but um, yes a recording of this will be available um, but you need to know that there is not just one point there could be a hundred there could be over thousands of such examples of house prices that you're trying to predict so how exactly do you go about uh, forming a best fit line which fits the entire um, you could say data set in this case so um, to do that there is something known as um, a loss equation uh, let us just look at the intuition behind the loss equation but so far are you guys following okay so not bad um, Hopefully you guys are following. I mean, I haven't covered anything complex so far. Okay, so um, if I draw the plot again, let's again we are assume we are doing it in two dimensions, so you know, two dimensional axis, and you have something like this, and I get something like this. Okay, assume this is your um, line, so. I am going to draw one particular line here and I want someone to tell me what that line corresponds to. Can someone tell me what is this? That red color line. Deviation, variation, deviation. Uh, y intercept. <laughs> no, it is not Y intercept. Deviation from the best fit line, correct. Okay, um, so in a way, you're saying that this is hypothetically the correct line, and my and the actual value, which is across here, deviates from the predicted value by this much, right? Let's say small e, yes, correct. So far, I mean, you guys following so far? In a way, you could say that e is actually my error right is the error in the prediction for example um, in this case you can see that the actual value is here let me use some other color you can see that the actual value is here but I have predicted this value here so if in that example if my actual value is 50 um, I have you know predicted something like 70 or 80 or so on Uh, why wouldn't it be perpendicular? Um, it's you know it's the deviation in terms of y. You're always taking deviation in terms of y because you're predicting y, right? If you take it along x, you're predict you're you know you're calculating deviation error of x, and you're not predicting x. So yeah, because x is constant, right? Your x is your input. It's always fixed. The number of bedrooms aren't going to change. Anyway, so this is, as you can see, um, basically what this corresponds to is um, your predicted minus actual. Okay, so far I hope you guys are following. Um, now the point of a machine learning algorithm for part two is you first, firstly it has to find the parameters. Secondly, it has to find the set of parameters that minimize the error, okay, because you are trying to find a model that is able to fit the line, right. The point is to fit that line. Now, your now the objective is, you know, you know, you can only fit that line if you minimize this error, right, because this is not the only error you have. You have error here, you have error here, um, 
here you don't have an error but here you have an error here big error here there's a small error and here there are about medium sized errors so the objective is to minimize these errors along you know the y axis obviously um, so in point is to minimize these errors so that the best fit line which is formed is a very good fit of the particular you know set of data that you have so so far is everyone understanding the point of error in this whole concept okay um, that's nice um, you know if you guys want me to repeat a concept feel free to do so linear regression is not very complicated uh, but it is very crucial for you to understand you know the next part because all the other algorithms that exist or most of the other algorithms in machine learning uh, they build on the same concept you know they build upon the fact that you find the error then they build upon the fact that you you know minimize this error so focus now and the later part will be easier for you to understand okay so someone wants me to repeat okay um so nikhil right okay i'm going to ask you some questions and uh, you're going to figure it out yourself so um what is this red color line here i'll just this red color line here Um, Nikhil, are you there? Like whoever asked the question. The uh, best line. Yeah. So that's the best fit line. Okay. So in a best fit line, those are the points which you are predicting. Right. You are saying that yes. this is the hypothetical value which I am going to predict. Correct? Yes. Okay. Now, it might happen that the value which you are predicting is not the actual value, right? Yeah. So, in that case, uh, there is some kind of error in the model. Are you following? Yeah. yeah. So, now basically, the you, you don't want an error in the model, right? You don't want to like overprice a house and or underprice a house for that matter yes so the point is you are trying to minimize this error and if you basically draw a perpendicular line along the y-axis from let's say this point to this point this is the difference right between your predicted value and your actual value uh, yes yeah, yeah so that is what you're trying to minimize that is the error in your model so thank you okay Okay, so um, now, so now every machine learning algorithm has something known as a loss function, also known as a cost function or an error function, you know, multiple names. Uh, let's just call it the loss function for now. So the loss function will basically give you how much error is there totally in your model. So if I were to, you know, get the total amount of error in the model, what do you think the error will be? Like, how do I write it? Let's say popular notation again. What do you think the error will be? Like, I know this is error one. Let's say this is error one. This is error two. I need all the errors. Okay, someone has typed out the summation symbol here. Okay, fine. Summation of E, correct. Um, so, yeah. It is basically the summation of all your errors. Um, I don't know why someone has typed a zero. But, um, okay, so summation of all your errors. So now the way you get this is you sum from i equals, no, whatever zero, whatever indexing you want, zero is usually used. Um, so from zero to m, where m is the total number of examples you have, and 0 to m and then what you do is so this is basically you know a summation of all the errors but the issue with this is this is uh, you know errors might be positive or negative you don't want the positive errors 
to you know sort of uh, dominate the negative errors or you know cancel them out so all you do is you just square them but the issue with squaring is they kind of you know uh, gives you a huge value so what people do is you take an average and this what you can see uh, here is popularly known as uh, j of theta is like a popular notation uh, this is the loss function as i mentioned loss or error function also known as cost function just we you know various names which is given what is m m here is the total number of examples uh, if you follow the notation here, where is that? M is the total number of, uh, okay, check. Um, one second. So as you can see here, M is the total number of um, examples that you have. That is the number of points in your uh, training data. In this case, number of house, number houses. Instead of squaring, why don't we take mod? um we are using the mean square error here there are different error metrics as well um you know you will cover you'll come to that later like different types of error functions uh linear regression usually uses the mean square error itself the variance um not the variance because you know you don't have the average here right you're not finding the deviation um, I mean, if you consider the prediction to be the average, it is the variance, yes, but not exactly the variance or in terms of the variance here. Because your predictions aren't the, the average values of all predictions, right? So you can't call it a variance. Variance is, we you know, when you take the average of all the values. In this case, the prediction is not going to be the average. Anyway, um, another small thing people do add a 2 here. Uh, you will see why we add a 2 there soon. But this particular formula here, I'm just going to box it up so it's kind of important. Um, you guys would have heard of this MSE or the mean square error. Um, hopefully, you guys understood how the formula came. The, you basically sum over all the errors. Y is the actual value. Yes, Y is the actual value at that particular X value. Is the formula with the 2M or only the M? Um, we are going to assume the 2M there. I'll tell you why the 2 is there soon. Um, okay, so XI, YI are, you know, XI is the input at that point. YI is also the input at that point, is the actual value at that point. You sum over all the errors. So summation from I equals 0 to M. And you square the errors because you know you don't want positive or negative. And finally, you take the average, so one by m and two into that. Um, what is the h? Okay, so <laughs> this you should have been there in the beginning. So the the equation in popular notation again is h of x equals theta naught x naught plus theta one x one plus theta two x two and so on. Where x naught is by the way equal to one. Your your features start from x1 and x2, not from x0. That is why, you know, if you have h of x equals theta0 plus theta1 x1, it is c plus x. In this case, is price of the house, correct. Yeah, I think I made us, no, I took it correctly. This is theta0, not zero. Um, any questions so far about the equation or about the loss function? Why did we take uh, 50 equals 0 uh, theta 0 plus theta 1? Um, so the, I was give, just giving an example of what the equation would look like for this example here. So um, one second. So this is one particular x i, right? This is x, let's say some particular xi and this is another one particular yi. So in this case, um, your some predicted value is equal to theta naught plus 
Oh, okay, wait, wait, wait. You're referring to this. Huh? Okay, okay, got it. Got it. Uh, no, the, what I'm trying to say is whatever you get from this particular part should be equal to 50. It will not be equal to obviously. I mean, you won't get 100%, but it should be equal to 50 or close to 50. You're trying to find those values of theta 1. For example, um, let's you let's say you're you know doing a simple problem that you guys have done in you know high school uh, where basically i give you a set of points x1 y1 x2 y2 and you need to find the equation of a line what do you do you first find the slope right the slope and the y intercept and then you basically you know form the equation of the line right using those values in this case the same thing um, in this case the notations are i mean theta naught and theta 1 popular notations again um and theta 2 and so on any other questions about this um yeah the loss uh, the loss function is uh like premeditated or does it change for uh, different graphs um the loss function depends upon the problem that you are solving okay so in multiple regression multiple linear regression that is this is the this is the thing that we are using okay but if you have um, a different problem, let's say you're doing a classification problem, which is not related to what I'm doing here, then you will have a completely different loss function. Uh, no, loss function does not depend on data set. It depends on the problem that you are solving. For example, if you had attended my machine learning talk, uh, you guys would remember that there is a class of algorithms called regression. There's a class of algorithms called classification. There is clustering and so on. Clustering has a different loss function. Uh, classification has a different loss function. Regression has different loss functions. Because you know you cannot use a you know a classification loss function for regression and vice versa. Um, you won't understand now, but if I I have to go into a bit more detail to explain why you cannot. For example, if you're predicting, let's say, uh, whether an email is, spa is spam or not. Okay. Now the output values are either one or zero. You cannot use this particular loss function, right? Because this is meant for like real values. It's not meant for, um, you know, fixed discrete values. So for a classification problem, you need something that is more for fixed values. Because in classification, you only, you know, output fixed values, whether it's spam or not spam. Hopefully that, are, you know, uh, kind of answered your question. Let me just see if there are any other questions. Um, what is theta in this case? Uh, theta corresponds to the parameters or the weights as discussed. Okay, so um, I am going to move on to the next part, which is how we exactly find these parameters. And this is something which is, you know, probably the hardest part of the session so far, because it's something which you guys haven't really, you know, covered before. Like so far, it's so, I mean, I know it's fine because there's nothing really complicated so far. Um, I'm going to, you know, now we're going to move on to the actual part of how, how a machine actually learns. So I'm just going to write the loss function properly again. Um, so uh, if you remember, this is theta naught plus theta one x um no one plus x one of i plus theta two x two of i minus um good um i hope hopefully this formula isn't confusing for you guys um all i've done is taken h of x of i and you know, expanded it out. You guys understood, right? I just expanded the formula. Okay. So um, now moving on to actually the hardest part of the session. But if you guys understand this part, um, you will be sorted for like uh, the entire of machine learning as well as deep learning. So like listen up now. Um, so we are going to cover something known as gradient descent. Um, it's a very popular algorithm which is used for finding the parameters theta. 
it is also a slightly challenging thing to understand at first um, but hopefully you guys will understand i'm going to go slowly so don't worry about that okay so now what i'm going to do is um okay so if you see here um, more or less this particular equation is um, a square equation right like it is something in the form of y equals x square that is a loss function i'm talking about okay um I'll just assume it is for now um okay so let us say um we have a plot here okay just a bit okay and you have let's say um okay let's say again we are working with um, two uh, one variable here so in this case the example is this or whatever you guys know in popular terms as y equals mx plus c yeah so in this case um let's say across this axis you have theta not and across this axis you have theta 1 can someone tell me what is this point and the plot is basically y okay so these are basic this line this black color curve corresponds to all the y values for each value of theta naught and theta 1 so can someone tell me now what is this value here minima okay uh, sorry 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 this is not y <laughs> oh sorry sorry uh, um, not why this is j j of theta basically so um if that is my loss um yeah i don't want the equations for that uh, point but yeah so that is j of theta and if i have the curve which represents the loss function for different parameters um this refers to the minima am i right so that's the minima of the entire equation yes or no simple yes or no is that the minima or is that not the minima okay good um now if you remember i said that this is loss right or this is basically the error so you so we can also say that at this particular point at this particular point whatever values of theta naught and theta 1 are present they are the best possible values right because they also correspond to minimum error or as someone said is the most right prediction yeah so is this point clear like i'm going to go step by step so you guys understand slowly one doubt yeah. uh, so like the y-axis and what like what are x-axis and y-axis how is the graph j of theta? okay so um you understood the loss function right or the error function here yeah, yeah. okay i didn't did okay so um assume we are not doing it for n variables but we are doing it for two variables so you have basically the y equals mx plus c equation you guys are familiar with okay so now now when you find the equation of a line which is y equals mx plus c you are finding m which is the slope and you're finding c which is you know the y intercept right yes or no so wait y here is j of theta right y, uh, no 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 j it refers to the loss or the error is the amount of error in your model whereas yes. h of x or y these both are same h of x is your prediction h here stands for hypothesis okay so h of x is basically the predicted value in this case you know call it y hat if you wanted to call it that but this is what you're predicting okay so um i'm going to write it in simpler terms so in this case your j will be equal to um
Oh, sorry, not x. Theta one x i x one i actually. Okay, so have you understood this loss function so far? This particular one I've written here. Yeah. Okay. So if you have understood that, you should know that this is the amount of total error which your model contains. Right. Yeah. So now if I now if you see what is variable here, as in what can you modify in this equation? Can you modify y? Can you modify the actual price of a house? No. Okay, so this is not. Can you modify x, which is the amount of bedrooms, whatever, whatever you have? No. Okay, so what can you modify here? The theta, theta naught and theta one. Okay, correct. Okay, stay on. You are following so far, so that's good. Now, assume for let's say I have a particular set of values, okay, and I plot theta naught from uh, something, let's say minus fifty to plus fifty, and I do theta one also like that, okay, minus fifty to plus fifty. Okay, one second. Um, so basically, what I'm saying, you plot it from minus fifty to plus fifty for both cases, okay. Um, and if you plot it for both cases and for at each point, that is at each particular corresponding value of theta naught and theta one, if you plot this thing, you know what will you get? What do you think you will get? The, uh, the, that parabola, like that? Yes, you will get that parabola. It might not be exactly like that, but you will get roughly around the same shape. Like it might be something like this or something like this. Okay. Like the shape or the curvature will differ, but uh, it will be a parabola because this is technically something of the form y equals x square equation. Uh, but don't worry about that part. Um, so you will get this thing, okay? So what I'm trying to say is, for your cost function here, j of theta, if you plot the cost for each particular value of theta, you will get this particular curve. Which, re which refers to your loss or your error. So far, are you like following? Yeah. So now what will this point correspond to then? Like this here. The minimum error, like the lowest possible value. Yes. So, so that corresponds to the lowest possible error you can ever have. And that is what you're trying to find, right? I mean, you always, you're always trying to minimize the error. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. So if you're trying to minimize the error, and if you know that the minimum error is at that point, so at that point, what are the values of theta naught and theta one? Are they good values or are they bad values? Uh, good values. Uh, so that is what you do. That is basically the point of, you know, that is how a model learns. So that is intuitively how it works. Uh, I'm going to now, you know, do the equation behind how it finds this. Um, someone has asked, um, uh, one second, there are two questions. Why are we not plotting theta 2, theta 3 and all? Because I cannot plot in four dimensions. So I'm going to take two dimensions as an example and plot. I do not know how to plot beyond that. Um, and then someone else has asked, um, why can't we not change the values of xi in the loss function? Because the values of xi are fixed, right? Because that is your input to your entire uh, problem statement, you could say. For example, if you have a data set of houses and or rather the features of the houses and the prices for that corresponding house, you can't change the number of bedrooms and stuff, right? That is fixed. You are supposed to learn that. For example, let's say in your high school equation and, uh, you know, high school, you are supposed to find xi, you're given, you know, xi, x1, y1, x2, y2, and they tell you to, you know, find the equation of the line. You're not going to change the value of x1, right? You're not going to change it to something else just to get an easier equation. So yeah, that is the point. So those are like constants in your equation because you can't change them. The only things which you can change are theta. Anyway, so um, moving on. So the question is now, how do we exactly find this? So uh, this is a question for all the people who are kind of good at math. I'm going to draw one particular thing. You're going to tell me what it corresponds to. Okay, I'm going to use some other color. What is this? What is that green color line? Tangent. 
okay good <laughs> smart um what okay let's say you find the tangent um if you guys remember i think in 12th grade if you had let's say y equals f of x how do you find the minimum value of f of x we differentiate differentiate and do what um equate it to uh, to zero and set the double differential if it's less or greater than zero okay you forget about a double dif double differentiate for now you differentiate and equate to zero and what do you yeah. get from that you solve for equal to zero right yeah so now in this case uh, you guys are good you're getting it so if i differentiate j okay and if i differentiate j and you know equate to zero what values will i get the point uh, the least possible errors you will get least possible error because you're differentiate and equate to zero but when you're solving for that what will you get theta not and theta one right which correspond to the least possible error yeah good so that is the point <laughs> so gradient descent is basically an iterative algorithm where you keep differentiating the function at different points until you get theta not and theta one and theta two and theta three and so on till you hit a z till you hit you know the minimum possible error so what you do is um, i'm just going to explain for those of you who did not understand so if you have any function um if you have any function um one person has raised their hand okay okay so if you have let's say any function and if you differentiate it that is the way you find the minima of that function and in this case we are going to be differentiating the loss function um because you know we are trying to find the minima of the loss function uh, by the way for those of you who have already understood uh, try to differentiate the loss function let's see if you can get it just differentiate that um i'll continue the explanation so you are trying to differentiate the loss function and you know get the minima of the loss function now when you differentiate it and equate to zero you will be able to you know solve that equation right because the point is to solve that equation and get the critical points as some of you said in this case the critical points are in terms of theta that is the terms of theta not and theta one so basically if you differentiate equate to zero find theta not and theta one then what will happen is you will be able to find the values for theta not and theta one that will help reduce the error. Um, I hope you guys understood this part. Did you guys understand? Yeah. Um, so good, you guys understood, and hopefully you guys are understanding now. Uh, of, of what I said when I meant that machine learning is uh, math and not anything, uh, not coding. Anyway, so, um, so that, you know, I had asked some of you to differentiate and try. In this differentiating two variables, uh, okay, good. So, for at least, uh, so we partially differentiate. No, we don't use chain rule, it's called partial differentiation. Um, so, partial differentiation is basically when you treat one of the variables as a constant and you know you differentiate the other variable if you are in physics cycle you would have encountered it i think in the first unit or hopefully you guys have done partial differentiation before i don't know um so just writing out the equations that we get okay actually before we get the equations um just uh thing. so um so assume um the th the values okay, why isn't this going away okay okay so assume that initially um oh yeah both cycles have the same math yeah okay assume that initially we have chosen some particular random values of um, theta naught and theta one okay um let's say the value is here okay and therefore we find the slope at this point and once we get the slope at this point uh, we get some particular derivative values right because you know you're differentiating it so you get some derivative values now what you need to do again is this will the derivative at this point will actually give you the direction in which to move to minimize that value do you guys understand 
because you know the derivative will kind of give you the direction to move in and if you guys are confused it's it works on the other side as well because if i derive at this if i differentiate at this point it will point in this direction okay so basically let's say if you are at a point here and if i differentiate it the slope is you know in this direction right so you can always say that in you know when you have this equation whenever you differentiate at a point the direction of the slope will give you the direction of the minima because if you see the tangent at this point you move in this direction if you see the tangent at this point you move in this direction you take the tangent at this point you move in this direction so it will always point towards the minima that is why it kind of works or that is like the reason it works so did you guys understand this the sign of the slope okay so um, and by the way the magnitude will obviously will tell you how much to actually move in i hope that part also is kind of clear because um, if you see here the slope will be higher so you will move by a larger margin if you are very close let's say here you will have a very small slope so you will move by smaller margins is this point also clear so these two points so magnitude will tell you how for, you know how fast you will approach the minima and the direction of the tangent or the direction of the slope will tell you in which direction is the minima have you guys understood these two points because if you guys have understood these two points we can move on anyone wants me to repeat it okay i am going to under you know assume you know you guys are understanding which is good okay so um has anyone tried to like differentiate this i tried okay nice um um point of minima and its direction these are two points yeah i was referring to that yeah okay you guys didn't get it so i'm going to just differentiate it for you okay um so again i'm going to be doing in terms of theta not and theta 1 but you know you will you know you have you have to do it for basically all the values of theta that exist um okay by the way uh, this is for two variables i mean so this is for one variable because you have theta not and theta 1 uh can someone tell me the shape or what will this be or rather what will this thing be if i have let's say five variables okay let's not five let's go with you know uh two variables for now if it's two variables what will be that thing uh so is the descent of the change of slope towards the minima yes you are trying to approach the minima by you know differentiating at every point and approaching the minima so you differentiate at a point you find the magnitude to move and you find the direction to move and you move in that direction again differentiate at that point find the magnitude to move find the direction to move and then move at that point bold kind of curve yeah that's a 3d curve you get correct um uh, i cannot draw that here so obviously not going to try um if it's four dimensions you get a four dimensional figure a uh, five dimensions five dimensional figure and so on so that is why someone had asked why am i ignoring theta 3 and theta 4 i am not ignoring it but i am taking the case of only one variable because that is all i can draw here i mean i can draw 3d but it's not going to come out well um okay so moving on to differentiating the actual thing so we have to find two things okay you you differentiate the cost with respect to theta not and you differentiate the cost with respect to theta 1 cool so um, let's just look at the equation and then differentiate um yeah so 1 by 2m is a constant so it cannot just you know stays outside and the summation also will you know stay outside 
so as you can see that's a square so the into 2 happens there because of you know the differentiation rule the summation stays and you know because it's a square so it's a it's initially the same thing at first x1 i multiplied by uh, the differentiation of this with respect to theta naught so if you are differentiate respect to theta naught everything else becomes a constant so if you differentiate respect to theta naught this becomes one since everything else is a constant this becomes zero and this i mean this is minus minus and this also becomes a zero but yeah so by the way if i remember i said you know you added two there for reasons later you will see that is the reason oh god that is the reason you add the two there give me just one second system is lagging a bit oh god Okay, fine. This will have to do. Um, and this is equal to basically um, one by m summation i equals zero to m theta naught plus theta one x one i minus y i. That's all. Um, that's it, right? Yeah. So I'm just gonna zoom up so you guys can see. Yeah, so this is the equation. Um, no, let me just write it in the next line. It's easier. So this two and two gets cancelled, so you get one by m. Um, this can be written by again h of x of y. So I'm just going to short it down and write it minus y of, and that is basically the first equation okay uh is this why i added it to in a denominator yes that is why i added so basically you know kind of uh computationally reduce it a bit um so similarly if i do the same for theta one can someone tell me what will be the you know x one by m into summation of that's one second, that's one second. let me just write the thing Okay, this two will come out again. Uh, this part will remain the same. Okay, so now what happens? So differentiating with respect to theta one. So everything else is a constant. So this is zero plus x one x one of i minus zero. So one by m. Um, again, I'm going to short it down and write. So h of x of i minus y. In this case, there's only one, so I can just write it as x i also. But yeah, basically you get this. Um, hopefully, these are the two equations which are used. I'll just circle them and box them up. And so um, this is for when you have theta naught and theta one. So if you guys remember, I had said that x naught is always equal to one, right? Right in the beginning, I had said x naught is equal to 1 because the equation is h of x equals theta naught plus theta 1 x 1, right? So this is basically your x naught and x naught is always taken as 1. So can I say that this is basically x naught here? Yes or no? Okay. Um, you guys understood that when I said x naught is 1. So far okay so if i say that that is x naught here you can see that if i differentiate with respect to theta naught i get x naught here if i differentiate with respect to theta one 
what do I get here? I hope you guys under, are understanding. You get x1. So um, let's say I have n variables, you know, n features like we had said, n features for the house. So theta n. So what would be the equation here? into xn yeah so basically for each so that this is why you can see when you are differentiating with respect to a particular parameter what also matters is the input to that parameter so you're seeing how the value changes with respect to that particular input so this is basically like a general formula what do i do control z here i can't so that can okay so okay so um, hopefully you guys understood the equations uh, you only need the general one you don't need the first two you can do with the general one itself um, so has everyone understood so far Yes or no? Okay. Um, anything you guys want me to repeat? I'm not gonna, you know, do the differentiation again. So just know that it's easy to differentiate. It's not that hard. Also, um, if you're wondering about the complexity of the math, that is the calculus part of the math. This is all the complexity there is in machine learning, at least. It's just differentiation again and again. Okay, um, now that this part is done, let's talk about the gradient descent algorithm. So, in gradient descent, what you do is you iteratively, you keep, you know, finding the derivatives at every point until you hit a certain minima or until you have a certain number of iterations. So, what you do is, um, I'm just going to write the algorithm here. So um, one popular term is known as epochs. Epochs refers to the number of iterations you're going to run gradient descent for. So it can be 20, it can be 100, it can be 10,000. So it is not necessary that the more number of iterations will lead to a more accurate result. I will come back to this point a bit later, but do remember this. More number of iterations does not always mean, um, you know, a more accurate result. So epochs is, you know, fit to some particular counter n. Um, okay. Anyway, so what you do is basically, so, so basically while your epochs are greater than zero. Okay. So basically while you, while you have uh, a certain number of epochs or certain number of, you know, you know, what do I say? You know, while it's not zero, basically. Epochs. Epochs is basically number of iterations. Um, they're again a popular term. You know. For example, you know how when you have for i in range, you know, this is like a normal for loop, right? In this case, your i is your loop variable. In that case, it's called epochs. I'm using all the traditional names here because, you know, if you guys do decide to read a few papers, these are the names you're going to come across. So, you know, preferably I'm using those names as well. So, while epochs are greater than zero, so basically while you're going for certain number of iterations. Uh, for now, let's just say the iteration is 20 for now. Okay, 20 iterations. So, the first thing that you need to do is uh, you need to kind of find the loss. Okay, you actually don't need the loss, but it's advisable to find. So, loss which is given by j of theta and you know you basically calculate the loss here it's it's a good practice just calculate the loss here okay so let's say it's a function that calculates the loss the next step is actually important this is actually um option uh, i'll tell you why to you know always have that anyway so what you do is there is something known as a simultaneous update which you need to perform okay so what you need to do is 
for every theta that is present you need to do theta is basically theta n minus alpha which is a constant I will come back to it later differentiate the cost with respect to theta n you have to do this for um, you know n equals 0 to whatever the value of n you have so in that example we had five features for a house so it will be from theta um, 0 to theta 4 yeah no wait five features right so theta 0 to theta 5 so six features because you add theta 0 okay so now what do I mean by simultaneous update so if you realize um, in this equation one second Um, if you are if you are differentiating with respect to let's say theta 1 you are also using the value of theta naught and theta 1 here right yes or no like to calculate the derivative you also need the value of the particular thing you are differentiating with so the way so now what will happen is you do not want your values of theta to change over a particular set of update statements so instead what you do is you do something like this um, I'll just write it out in like a kind of pseudo code so it's easier for you so you kind of do something like mu theta n equals theta n minus alpha into so in this case what will happen is you will be able to store the you know new values of theta here Whereas your old values of theta will always be used here. I think you guys are a bit fuzzy with this. Uh, do you want me to repeat it? So the value of the uh, value of theta used in the differentiation function remains constant, but the value which we are updating keeps changing. Uh, close. Correct. Okay. So, in the, diff in the derivative formula, you will notice that when you are differentiating with respect to theta 1, theta 2 or whatever value of theta, uh, you will see that you are also using the values of theta to like find the derivative value. Okay. So, now what you want is, now for every iteration in the gradient descent function, for every iteration, you need to produce a new value of theta. Right but you do not want to use an updated theta to find the value of another uh, okay so basically what okay let's just compare the old one and the new one okay so this is what i have written now and if you remember the previous one was basically theta n is equal to theta n minus alpha into this by theta n okay now let's assume we have again two variables okay and let's say I do something like theta 0 equals uh, okay let's say uh, I have a small table here theta one, theta one. this is 1 1 and minus uh, let's say alpha into okay, you know what whatever, whatever the formula is now um, let's assume that this entire thing comes to 1 okay so, okay it's already 1 uh, let's say this entire thing comes to 2 okay just assume hypothetically it comes to 2 so then what will happen is the new value of theta naught is 2 but now when I am using theta 1 if I do theta 1 I will do theta 1 minus when I find this particular derivative value that is derivative of j with respect to derivative of theta 1 I am also going to use the other values of theta right so what will end up happening is I will use the value of theta naught as 2 instead of using the value of 1 which I am supposed to use. Did you understand that? So basically what I am trying to say is when I am calculating the derivative, I do not want to use the updated values, but I want to use all the old values that were present at a particular function because then what will happen is every time I calculate the derivative of a function, I will calculate it at different points in the function because the theta is getting updated again and again. Does that make sense? 
hopefully a few more so when you have theta one equal to theta one minus that yeah uh, here the value of theta in the j that we are differentiating that will change every time yeah so it you because and theta one theta one won't change yeah because okay see initially let's say both are one okay initially let's say both are one and when you do this operation theta naught becomes two okay so theta naught will become two here now you also need to perform this operation right yes or no yeah so when you're doing this operation now can you tell me what uh, so this derivative you found when theta naught and theta one are one comma one now what will happen if what will happen if you find this derivative where theta naught is two but theta one is one what does it mean you will find the derivative at a completely different point yeah yeah so you don't want that right because you need to differentiate at the same point what will end up happening is if i just go to the curve so if i find the derivative at this point okay let's say i find it at this point if i don't store the temporary don't store it in a temporary variable the next time i find i will find it probably somewhere here or even here or you know somewhere even here for that matter because it keeps changing and you don't want that you want this point to be fixed right for every particular value of theta uh, do you guys understand or do you want me to repeat it again Um, it's a j of theta j of theta will be calculated with the values 1 comma 1 or 2 comma 1 1 comma 1 you want to calculate with 1 comma 1 that is when yeah. you store it in a temporary variable here and don't use okay it. then I... got it yeah uh, i i have a doubt um, in the second part when theta naught becomes 2 then we are taking the value of Theta is two instead of one. I mean, I'm kind of confused at the okay, point. Okay, wait, wait. I'll do it again. Okay. Um. So let's assume you're starting with the values one comma one. Okay, for theta naught and theta one. Okay. Um. Just one second. Yeah. So you're starting with um. Why is this lagging? Fine. Okay, so uh, you're starting with theta naught and theta one as one and one. Now, if you're doing this update statement, okay, let's say doing this, let's say this is one and this is two. Uh, if I'm doing one, what will happen is I will get theta naught equals that particular thing, right? And then what will happen is, uh, let's assume this comes to two. Okay, so then this becomes two, right? yeah now I, I also need to find for theta one correct this particular operation i need to perform yeah so this particular value here right mm -hmm. see this entire value here so what value of theta naught will be used here uh, two i guess but if you find theta naught at two it means the point at which you differentiated this is different from the point at which you differentiate this yeah i get it now hmm. so you do not want this to happen so you store it in a temporary variable <laughs> does that make sense yeah is it like some infinity loop sort of thing that happens uh you can't run it for an infinite loop but you run okay. it for a certain number of iterations yeah so basically we're putting the value uh, we're putting the wrong value in the where, where the place we were differentiating it. Uh, not wrong value. Yes, you're putting the previous value. You could say. Yeah, yeah, previous value. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. Write it again. So we are updating theta again and again till we reach the this thing minimum error. Yeah. So one second, just one second. I'll tell you how the update happens. Um, by the way. Oh, well, I don't need this. Okay, so basically you need to do this for every n from, you know, zero to till the number that you have. Uh, theta n, uh, new theta n is a temporary variable. Yes, new theta n is a temporary variable. 
so now what do you do? So now what you need to do is, um, you know, there are a few methods which people use. Uh, you, uh, you can either have a breakpoint, that is, if your current loss goes below a certain threshold, any kind of threshold here, then you can break. Or you can just, you know, continue the loop. To continue the loop, what you have to do is, uh, for every theta n, you have to just assign it to new theta. That's pretty much gradient descent. So you find the loss. Loss is just to you know get an uh, get a sort of measure on how your model is doing. Uh, then you find the new particular values of theta, and then you just reassign all the values to the new theta. So the way you implement this in code is you probably create an array which stores all the theta values, and you create another temporary value temporary array. Could you repeat how we come out of the loop? Uh, it's not an infinite loop. Oh yeah, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> or epochs minus equal to one. Whatever language you guys are used to. It's not an infinite loop. It runs for a certain amount of time. So this is the you know algorithm for gradient descent. Do you guys have any doubts? Um, what is the application of this uh, thing that we did right now? Um, are you talking about application of gradient descent? Um, yeah, like... Um, okay, so, yeah. so the thing about gradient descent is it's kind of like a universal algorithm. Regardless of the loss function, it will always be able to find the minima of the loss function using this particular method. Yeah, so this whole method was the uh, gradient descent uh, yes. method. This entire okay. thing is called gradient descent. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to answer one of the questions one person has been spamming in the chat. Um, can someone tell me uh, what do you think this will probably do? Oh yeah. By the way, someone asked what is an array. Um, sorry about that. If you're not from a CS background, but um, an array is basically like a list. If you've done Python, which I hope you guys are doing for your ISAs, <laughs> then the um, it's a list. Assume it to be a list. Okay. Um, so, can someone tell what is alpha here? Uh, one of the isn't that shouldn't that be a continuous instead of break there? Loss is less than epsilon. So, um, in that case, epsilon is like a threshold loss that you have. So, if your loss goes below a certain point, you just break out the loop. It's like a minimum loss. Okay. Actually, you know, you can do without the break. I mean, without this. Usually, the normal gradient descent does not have this. You would just continue until the certain number of iterations uh, go on. Okay. So, um, some constant. Okay. Um, okay. If you guys remember, I said there were two points, right? In the slope curve, you know graph whatever so there is a magnitude and there is a direction right because if you differentiate at any point there's the magnitude of the slope and there's also the direction of the slope now if i multiply the magnitude with a constant what happens guys hello if the value changes yeah, so the value can either increase or decrease, right? That particular magnitude. Yeah. Yeah. So alpha over here is known as the learning rate. Okay. Um, talk about it here. So alpha in this case is known as the learning rate. And how this matters is it will tell you how fast to approach the minima because this is directly being multiplied into the magnitude of the slope which you're calculating because uh, the equation is basically theta n is equal to theta n minus alpha into you know the slope here right so this will basically give you
or how quickly or rather how much to change theta. Uh, does that make sense? So if I have a very large value of uh, you know alpha, what do you think will happen? A very large value of alpha. Will I approach the minima quicker? There will be a wild swing in the uh, you know, theta and values. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay, someone said decrease rapidly, lesser iterations, uh, but less accurate. Okay, why do you think it will be less accurate? Do you know why it will be less accurate? Whoever said less accurate, uh, do you know why it will be less accurate? Um, yeah, if you're trying to get close to a value, you want to have as much precision as you can. Okay, well, it take like that? you have lower, I mean, if you move by one unit, it's um, less precise than if you move by point one unit. That is true. Um, I'm gonna you know, like tell you graphically why. So um, this is the you know the curve. Okay, so uh, let's say we are starting at, you know, this point and we basically need to reach this point here because this is like, you know, where we need to be. So if you're starting at this point, so if you take, if you have, let's say alpha equals 0 0.01, okay, the steps you're going to take are like, going to be like this. So this is the iteration one, this is the iteration two. Iteration three. Okay, I'm gonna draw it out. Um, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, let's assume in nine iterations it changes. Okay. In nine iterations, it will reach the minima. But if I take larger steps, let's say I have alpha equals one. I might reach here. I might reach here. Okay, let's say this iteration one, this iteration two. But here is where the issue comes in, okay. Uh, yes, I am approaching the minima quicker, but there is also a chance of this happening. Did you understand? Uh, did you guys understand what happened? So, yeah. there is a chance you might completely overshoot the minima. Because you're moving that quickly. You're overstepped. Yeah. So, and what ends up happening in a lot of cases is uh, if you have a large alpha, if your point is here, you'll first go here, then you'll come back here, then you'll come back here, and then you'll come back here, and you will never be able to, um, you know, what do I say? Approach the minima because you're always oscillating around the minima, but you're never at the minima. But if you keep decreasing at 0 0.01, uh, you will steadily reach the minima, but you know, at a much slower pace. That is why uh, you try to keep alpha at a certain rate, which is, you know, neither too high to overshoot, but neither too low to, you know, that it takes days and days. So what people do is they cannot train it in stages. So for a certain number of iterations, you set alpha to let's say, you know, 0.1. Let's say 10 iterations you set for 0.1 and you reach a certain value. Then what people do is they train it for 10 more iterations, but they decrease the alpha. So they decrease it to 0.01 now. And they train it for like 10 more iterations with 001. So if you go in this way, you will, you know, reach the minima much faster while also, you know, kind of being accurate. So this is you know, about alpha and this is known as the learning rate. Any questions about this? Or what about if we can change uh, alpha along with like uh, at runtime, like you can. along with the you can. Uh, mm -hmm. There is something known as alpha decay. Uh, uh, alpha decay is there, there is a formula for alpha decay. I don't remember it now, but basically it depends on number of iterations as well. It's, uh, so Danva Shriyas, do you remember it? It's basically alpha equals alpha by uh, some some iteration to the power something okay um 
but basically yeah, as the number of iterations increases the alpha also keeps decreasing uh, so, i have a question yeah uh, you said when alpha is greater than like alpha is really big it's it it might just go beyond the yes. the minimum required but we have a threshold if statement right if loss is less than the threshold yeah, yeah. okay yeah i agree that there is but the thing is normal implementations do not have that if statement so you know what i'm just going to you know erase it for now so it removes confusion the normal implementations which will find in various libraries and stuff they do not have yeah. an if statement the if statement is if you want to modify it in case you want to break out of a certain thing uh, oh, okay the if statement is also used to you know prevent this particular phenomenon from happening where it starts oscillating oh, okay thanks okay um any other questions about alpha any other questions um uh what if you use a larger alpha at first and over steps you give it a smaller alpha value yeah that is something known as alpha decay um it's a popular method in deep learning but not used in machine learning i am not sure about the exact formula it's but it's something around this where you basically divide alpha by a particular value where i is basically the iteration number so as the number of iteration increases alpha keeps decaying but it's not exactly that formula so uh, don't take my word for it could be different um why don't we use an if statement because in most implementations you set it to run for a certain number of iterations and it runs for that many iterations and then it just breaks the if statement is you know also implementable but it's a separate feature which is present uh, deep learning libraries do have that it is something known as early stopping where you stop it early after you hit a certain number of uh, some certain amount of loss but don't worry about all these terms now have you guys understood this particular point of alpha okay um so there is this one small thing which i forgot to mention um when you have a machine learning algorithm there are two kinds of things it has to learn why is someone trying to join now <laughs> okay so when you have a machine learning algorithm there are two kinds of things it has to learn um there's something known as the parameters and okay it has only it has to only learn the parameters there's another there's something there okay this is not machine learning this is I'm referring to high parameters okay so when you have parameters in a machine learning model there are two types these are the learnable parameters and these and the other terms other ones are the hyperparameters so what is the difference between them learnable are the ones that the algorithm learns so this is theta in this case okay because the algorithm is learning theta from the data you provide hyperparameters are those parameters which you provide to the algorithm so that it learns the learnable parameters so basically you provide these values on your own so can you name one hyperparameter here x1 and y1 xi yi is those are not parameters those are uh, kind of constants those don't change at all alpha yeah so in this case it is alpha okay so have you guys understood this point Uh, about hyperparameters, learnable parameters. Okay. Uh, okay. So far, does anyone have a doubt in any part which was covered? Yes. Okay. I'll ask. Like, uh, I mean, uh, it's related to the very first thing, and like because of that, it's not able to understand like whatever follows. Okay. So apparently, with uh, yeah. With this uh, function, you wrote h of x equals theta naught mm. plus theta one x one plus theta two x two. Yeah. There, um, uh, x one and x two are the constants, and theta naught, theta one, theta two are the variables. Yes. 
or rather okay. uh, or, or rather wait i'll tell you an easier way to understand it do you recognize this line yes it's okay. the equation of a straight line yeah. if i give you x1 y1 x2 y2 what are the what are you trying to find out now if i tell you to find the equation of this line what will you try to find the slope what about this um yeah i mean x and m and c m and c no so a machine yeah. learning algorithm has to do exactly the same thing instead when you give it h of x equals theta not plus theta 1 x1 plus theta 2 x2 plus you you give it you give it x1 you give it x2 you give it xn you give everything and you inst you find theta not you find theta 1 you find theta 2 and so on wait so x1 x2 xn are the inputs yes and theta not theta 1 theta 2 are the outputs yes then what is h of x like what is the lhs of this equation h of x is the predicted value at that point so uh, now let's say so the thing is you do not have two points here okay you might have hundreds or you might have a lot of zeros after it right now okay. you might never get a you know you will never get a value which is exactly equal to y okay but what okay. you will get is you will get some value which is close to y okay and that is called h h here stands for hypothesis Wait. Okay. Can we just uh, discuss about this using the house uh, anal analogy? Okay. Okay. Like, huh. yeah. Uh, what I was so here, h of x is the predicted value, predicted value of the price of the house by my model, right? Yes. By the model. Okay. Yeah. And x one, x two are the number of rooms and uh, kitchen yes. and hall. Yes. Then what are theta naught and theta one and theta two? These are the these are the slopes you are finding out, right? Your slopes, your y, and your constant. No, you house analogy. Can you tell? Um. Okay. So if you have your features here, you are trying to. Um. Okay. There is. What do I say? Okay. So when you have y equals m x plus c. Okay. Okay. You have a straight line, right? Some um, yes. Some straight line like this. So how does it know how to construct this straight line? Like on um, what basis do you construct this straight line? You need a particular slope and you need a particular constant, right? Yes. Similarly, let's say you have uh, okay. Let's say the price of a house depends on upon only two things. It depends upon the area of a house, and it depends upon the number of rooms in the house. Let's say five. Okay. okay. in this case what you will do is you are again trying to form a straight line wait wait sorry so let's say there is only one feature because you have only one x here, right let's say the price of a house depends only on the area of the you know, house okay in that case what will happen is you also need to again find a straight line that fits these points okay such that for one particular value of area You have one particular price. Okay. Did you understand that? Yeah. Yeah. I think I just need some time to digest it. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm getting it. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. I guess I get it. Yeah. Thank so you. basically, what you're trying to do is, uh, you know, for a given area or anything for that matter, whatever it is, you are trying to find. the set of parameters theta theta 1 whatever so on such that you know your whatever predicted value you have is close to the actual value of the house right that is yeah. what, that is what when you have two variables it is easy right because there is one straight line which fits through both points yes yes but when you have you know uh, you know multiple points you cannot do that instead what you do you try to form a line that goes through as many points as it can 
that is, yeah. that is why you have something called a hypothesis because it is not exact yes okay yeah i get it that is better yeah thank you yeah sure, sure. okay um when we just go through the questions could you explain hyperparameters Yeah, as Dhruv said, um, hyperparameters are the parameters which you feed into the model while you're training it. That is, the model will not learn hyperparameters on its own. Rather, you give it the parameter value and it will use that value to find the other values. Hopefully, that explains what hyperparameters are. Um, any other questions so far? We are like approaching the end. So... Okay. Um, okay, I'm gonna assume that silence means uh, no doubts. So I hope all of you guys understood that if you have a very small alpha, it'll take a large time to reach the minima. And if you have a very large alpha, you will overshoot the minima. Okay, so this is basically linear regression. This is actually that's all for linear regression. Uh, at the end of it, you will get the parameters uh, theta naught, theta one, and so on. Um, for all those of you who, you know, I mean, this actually should apply for all of you. Uh, do try implementing this algorithm from scratch. Um, it is actually not that hard to implement it because all it requires are a bunch of loops going again and again. Um, so do try implementing this algorithm from scratch. It is not difficult and uh, it, it shouldn't take that much time either. And, you know, we'll help for those of you who aren't from CS backgrounds, it will help you, you know, coding uh, wise. Okay, so that is it for linear regression. Uh, next session be after ISA. Uh, the next ML session will be after ISA. So don't worry about that. So, but before we part, there is one uh, neat trick which you guys should know. Um, so this is, uh, you know, linear regression, right? So the thing about linear regression is it belong, it also belongs to a class of algorithms in a way which have a closed formula. Does anyone know what this means? What does a closed formula mean? Can you repeat your question? Okay. So linear regression belongs to a class of algorithms that has a closed formula or rather it has a closed solution in a way. Finite terms, not exactly. Okay, so basically when I mean a closed solution, I mean that there is a direct formula to solve it. So you don't have to do gradient descent. Uh, you don't need to do gradient descent to actually solve linear regression. Uh, there is a direct formula for it. And uh, in fact, you will learn the derivation of this formula in second year. I mean, for the CS kids at least. Um, you know, When you come to fourth semester, you have a course on linear algebra where you have the derivation for the entire uh, closed solution. So it's very simple, uh, but you need to do a little bit of jugglery first. Um, it's not too complicated. So as I said, your x contains features, right? From x1 to xn. Yeah. And your y is basically you know, a set of real numbers here. So what you do here is you create x such that you add x0 here and then you have x1 to xn. Okay, so to create x1, what do you add in here? What is x1? I mean, sorry, what is x0? My bad. What is x0? 1. Okay, good. So you just add one column of 1s here. And y will remain the same. There is no change in y. So um, the formula for this is basically theta is equal to x transpose x whole inverse x transpose x. You do that and you will directly get a vector of, um, you know, theta values. That's it. Uh, that is basically the closed solution for linear regression. Um, can someone tell me why would you not prefer using this? Why would you not use that? That will actually directly give you the answers. It will directly give you theta, but it will not only directly give you theta, 
but it will also give you the exact values of theta. The exact values for you know, the lowest cost. Too complex, it takes time. Lack of accuracy. Mm. Lack of accuracy is wrong because it will give you the exact formula. It is based on the least squares equation. Um, so yeah, you will get the accurate answer. In fact, you might get more accurate answers than gradient descent. The right answer is it is too complex. Um, yeah, computationally very expensive. If you guys know inverse is actually a very complex equation to, not complex equation, complex operation to perform. Uh, transpose of a matrix is very simple. Uh, multiplying two matrices also is, you know, simple. But inverse of a matrix calculation is very computationally expensive. That is why even on, you know, most of your calculators which you have, you don't have the inverse operation there. Because, you know, it's very computationally expensive to do that. And we are talking about X transpose X. And as I said, uh, you could have, let's say, let's say you have 1000, you know, rows. And let's say the number of features you have is 5. So when you do 1000, uh, okay, so this is from 5 into 1000. So the size of X transpose is 5 into 1000. And okay, my bad. <laughs> um, in this case, it's 5, but you won't be working with 5 cross 5. Um, adjoint is a big headache in code. Yeah. Uh, there are other methods to do it, but you know, not, uh, not only adjoint of a matrix like you learned. Um, so basically, in this case, there are 5, but you know, when you're working with regression, you might face certain problems where the number of features can go into hundreds. In that case, when you do 100 cross 100 and you try to do the inverse, it becomes computationally very, very expensive to do this. So it is never used. Um, uh, yeah, Anil, whoever asked that. Um, so yeah, so people do not prefer using that because it is computationally expensive to do. Uh, and that's why people do prefer using gradient descent. Um, any questions? Any questions so far about anything? Because we have kind of approached the end. Um, any questions so about anything? Approx, uh, what value of M can my computer handle? Uh, um, I mean, okay, see all these values, all this will be loaded into your memory, right? Um, I have handled 100,000, more than that. More than 100,000, it will easily handle. Don't worry about that. I'm talking about data set sizes, which can go into 200 to 300 MB. You can easily handle all that. Uh, using this function, right? The one which you have written here. Oh, wait, no, no, no. This one, don't try that. <laughs> no, I was asking for this function itself. Oh, this, function. Uh, this function, don't go. Uh, this function actually depends on the number of features, not on the number of rows. Uh, Is it so cool five? Yeah. So uh, if it's more than 100, don't do. Uh, okay. Number of rows, don't worry. So yeah, uh, do uh, do try coding it out from scratch. Um, you know, what do you guys think? Is the algorithm is the entire linear regression algorithm complex? Is it very complicated? Is it very complex? Like I know it is new, but I'm pretty sure the new concept isn't very complex. Yeah, it's okay. It's it is new. I agree. But it's not something like rocket science or, uh, you know. Something that you guys don't really understand. The maximum level of complexity is probably the you know the, the differentiation you guys did. So yeah, um, in fact, um, the reason we are not covering code here is because you have Scikit-Learn, which is a library for machine learning. It takes only four lines to implement all of this, so, so we are not going to be covering code. Um, any other questions about anything?
any feedback on anything do you guys want me for the next sessions um the other mentors will be taking i won't be taking so do you guys want them to go slower do you guys want them to go a bit faster you guys want us to include something else also uh, we went into this much of math detail is uh, mainly because uh, this is the most basic machine learning algorithm and um, you know this also serves as the basis for other machine learning algorithm in fact when you do logistic regression um, it will actually build on this concept it will actually use everything from linear regression is used with one small little change so yeah most algorithms do build on this concept in fact even um, you know a neural network will build on the same concept I am guessing nobody has any kind of doubts. We are also approaching the two hour mark. Um, so just a quick note. Um, so this is uh, what we covered is actually linear regression. Uh, by linear, I mean you are trying to draw a straight line through your data. So if you have data like this, you draw a straight line through it. But what if your data is like this? So something like this. In that case, you have something known as polynomial regression. Um, I won't be covering polynomial regression because uh, it is slightly harder to do and also not don't worry too much of the derivation and all. But polynomial regression is actually a special case of multiple linear regression. Uh, just to explain what it looks like, I'm just going to write, write the equation so you understand. Um, in polynomial, that is polynomial x1 square yeah. x1 um, yeah. and so on so basically as you can see the powers of x are you know as in the the variable x is in powers uh, polynomial is actually a special case of multiple linear regression because you can assume um, you know theta 2 into x to be one another type of variable people just call it theta hat and theta 3 hat into x3 and so on so basically it is a special case of multiple linear regression uh, don't worry too much about that um, you know if you guys are interested do, do read up on it there is something else known as simple linear regression simple linear regression is basically what you guys already know uh, the reason i did not cover simple explicitly is because you know it's easier if i cover the general equation and then break it down into the simple one so simple linear regression is basically what you guys know as you know linear equation of a line so yeah these are the two special cases and that's it for the session. Um, I'm going to stop recording. Feel free to leave any feedback now.